Good morning, everyone. How are you guys today? Good to hear. Uh, it's snowing outside, which makes me feel comfortable because I'm from Canada and uh, we got snow all the time these days. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, how water is more important than oil. And I'm going to start off showing you that water, the water crisis is one of our biggest crises we're facing uh, today. That each of us consumes 2,100 gallons of water every day. And I'm going to show you how you can save 250 to 500,000 gallons a year yourself just by making some small changes. Now, Stephen's uh, given a little bit of an introduction about uh, me. So I did have a corporate career before I got into journalism, and that's downtown Toronto in the winter. It looks nice, but it's pretty cold uh, this time. So my midlife crisis came as a result of uh, my corporate, uh, well, the members of the board of the company I work for, suggesting that they didn't need my services anymore. And so that afforded me an opportunity to make a decision about what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And some of the things I knew I liked weren't in the corporate world. I liked to be outside. I liked to learn new things. I liked science. Um, and I liked environmental issues. You know, had become more important to me. I had taken journalism in college, so I did have that. So I thought, OK. Why can't I do the kinds of things I want to do and bring uh, things that I think that are important to other people? So a few years later, it's quite a struggle to be a freelance uh, journalist. So I've been doing it for 25 years. And these are, these are the people I write for right now. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to uh, you know, make a career of it, because many people can't as a full-time profession. That led to um, the book. And Stephen's right, it took a heck of a lot of math, not my strong suit, um, and a lot of research. So before I talk about what your water foot really is, I want to talk about rhinos. So a few years ago, uh, I was on assignment in South Africa, and I was with a couple of trackers, you know, walking through the bush in the Kruger National Park, and we were looking for rhinos. Um, so rhinos are, you know, they're pretty big, and you're walking, and the guys got guns because they can charge, so they're unpredictable. Uh, so finally, we're tranching through the bush for an hour or so, and they say, okay, look over there. There's a pair of rhinos. And I go, uh, I don't see anything. I just see more, more bush. I said, OK, we'll get a little bit closer. So we got closer. And they said, see, they're a mother and her baby. And I had to say, yeah, I don't see anything but more bush. Now, this was getting a little bit embarrassing because I'd already been bragging about all day how I'm such an outdoors guy up in Canada. Uh, you know, I can spot the deer and the coyotes and all that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> they said, well, we can get a little bit closer, but, you know, it's going to get, you know, we're, it's, it's riskier. And we certainly don't want to have to shoot at the animals. I said, well okay, well, okay, let's be careful and let's get a little bit closer. So we got a little closer, and I still couldn't see them until finally I went, oh, you mean those big gray boulders there, the ones that are moving. <laughs> and yeah, so that was just quite embarrassing. And it took a little while, you know, I was very quiet after that. <laughs> because, you know, rhinos are kind of big uh, and kind of obvious. But I realized I had only ever seen a rhino in a zoo. I didn't know what they looked like in the wild. The next day we went looking for rhinos again. And by the end of the day, I was almost as good as the trackers at spotting the rhinos because I had changed my 
mental picture of what a rhino looks like. And that's what I'm hoping to do here today, is change your picture, your mental picture of water. I want to help you gain what I'm going to call water vision, to see all of the water that's around us, all the water that it takes to make everything we have in our lives, from our food to our clothes, to our electronics, to our electricity. So that's what I'm hoping my book will do, and I'm hoping that's what we can get into today. So, demonstration time. It's a beautiful place, and of course, it's mostly water, right? Most of our planet is covered in water. 70% of the surface is water. Most of it, of course, is oceans, right? But 97% is seawater. The other 3% is fresh water. Now, where is most of that fresh water? Well, it's locked up in the polar ice caps, Greenland. You can see all the big ice on the top there. Uh, Antarctica, glaciers on mountains. Uh, permafrost throughout the northern hemisphere, so underground. And of course there's aquifers. Many of the aquifers, the underground water sources, are actually uh, either too remote or uh, too saline or salty for use uh, as fresh water. Um, as, I, as Stephen also alluded to, yes, the book has a lot of numbers and I am not going to be able to remember all the specifics, but in there it talks about what percentage of the the rivers and lakes of the world. It's a very tiny percent, even though they've got the gigantic Great Lakes uh, right next door. It's actually a very tiny percentage of the amount of water. Um, so in the end, the amount of water we have available for human use, fresh water, is very, very small. And I'm going to do a, hopefully not a messy demonstration here. So let's say this is all the water in the planet. So the first bits, of course, is all salt water, salt water, salt water, salt water. I actually didn't measure the glass, so I'm not sure. So let's say that's uh, some fresh water. I might have to drink some. Uh, <coughs> so, okay, ice caps coming in now, the glaciers, groundwater that we can't use, uh, saline aquifers, uh, water that's just too far away for human use, and uh, the little bits, of, little bits of water that are left, these little last drops, there's all the water we have. I actually worked this out in the, in the book, uh, using liters and all that stuff. So it's actually, it liter literally works out to one liter jug. In one liter jug, one drop of water is all the fresh water that we have as a, as a ratio. So it's not nearly as much water as we think. So where does all the water go that we use? I mentioned 2,100 uh, gallons a day. So that's the typical... Uh, daily household use is about 100 gallons, 80 to 100 gallons. <laughs> the toilet is one of the big users. Uh, this is an average breakdown of where water goes, how we use it within our house. So this is what the water we see. So we call this the direct water use. So this is water we see. Um, the other 2,000 gallons I'm going to talk about is the water we don't see, the indirect or virtual water it's also called. So I broke it down into this little graph, converted it into gallons. Um, so you can see the water we use in the house on your right, and the virtual water or the indirect water use for all the stuff we have. And this is daily per person water consumption. 2,000 gallons is pretty heavy. If you had to carry it, it's like pushing two or three cars. Um, so, let's get into the actual water footprints. So that's what it's called. Water footprints is a term used to describe how much water it takes to make something. So we're going to take, well, this is 16 ounces, so it's close enough. So 46 gallons for cola. So what's cola made of? Well, it's mostly sugar, so sugar water. Where does sugar come from? And this is how I worked this out. Sugar comes from corn, it comes from sugar beets, it comes, can come sometimes from cane. So worked out how much sugar goes into that, how much water does it take to grow the plant to make the sugar. 
Um, in the case of uh, cola, I think it's about uh, eight gallons. So not that much, but the big part of uh, the water footprint for cola is uh, the flavors that are in there. So it has um, vanilla. So vanilla is a tropical plant, also takes uh, a lot of water to grow. It takes a lot of water to process vanilla to turn it into something you can use as a flavor enhancer. And uh, cola also contains caffeine. Caffeine comes from coffee plants. Coffee plants, uh, also a tropical plant that needs a lot of water. The, uh, there's some water usage in terms of the processing and the shipping. And this little uh, plastic water bottle also takes water to make. Um, so it takes roughly five of these worth of water to make one of these plastic containers. Yes, and that doesn't include the water that's in there. So th uh, what's plastic made of? Plastic is made of oil. You need, oil, you need water to get oil out of the ground. You need water to process oil uh, and make plastic. Cup of coffee, again, tropical plant, takes a lot of water to grow, 37 gallons. Tea is uh, a, a more water efficient. Uh, it takes a little bit less. I get a, um, my cheat sheet, nine gallons, so quite a bit uh, different. Then the numbers get really big when you get into meat because the meat's a very water intensive um, way to produce food. The cow, well, you could say it drinks a lot. It's not that, it's not the drinking, it's the food it eats. So it eats tons and tons of grains, which require water to grow. So you work out how much they eat and how much it takes, how much water it takes to grow. You can figure out um, how much water ends up being in a, well, what is basically a medium-sized hamburger. Um, by contrast, if you had a soy burger, it's only 66 gallons. Um, so there's like a, a 10 to 1 ratio. So for a calorie of meat, it takes 10 times as much water as it does for a calorie of uh, veg uh, vegetarian product. Obviously, everything takes water. Uh, before I continue on, I should mention quickly about the meat and sustainability. This comes up a lot. So just back to the, oh, backwards. That uh, just because it takes a lot of water doesn't always mean it's unsustainable. So if you have grass-fed beef, for instance, not using fertilizers or um, any other stuff, you're not sending them off to feedlots, so there isn't any water pollution and there isn't any uh, taking water out of the ground. You just use rain. Then you could argue that's a sustainable production of a, a food from a water perspective. So, uh, so even though it takes a lot of water, you could argue about is this the best way to use our limited water resources? Well, that's a different uh, discussion, but uh, certainly it can be from a uh, point of view of sustainability. So one of the things to remember in all these big numbers is this is water that can't be used for something else. So these numbers are net numbers. These are not numbers. These are the water I'm talking about here isn't being reused, can't be reused. So we already eliminated that part. Sometimes you can reuse water, you can clean it. But in all cases, these are the net numbers. So you've got uh, your rice, fair amount of water. Well, what happened to the water? Well, okay, a lot of the water goes into the ground. Some of the water is actually in the plant. Most of the water evaporates. It evaporates and goes someplace else. So effectively, you can't use that water again on that particular piece of ground, uh, ground because it's evaporated or it's in the soil. We can't reuse it that way. It's part of the water cycle. It goes someplace else, so those little molecules uh, are, have gone elsewhere. Um, so that's why these are net numbers, not uh, gross numbers. Cotton is grown usually in very dry places. It uses a lot of water for uh, keeping the plants going. Processing uses a lot of water because there's lots of dyes involved, the softening of the fabric, um, and so on. So it's one of the bigger uses. You know, so we're all wearing probably 10,000 
uh, well, a liter, so three or four th thousand gallons of water. Cell phones, like any product, requires water. This one's, of course, much more difficult to uh, figure out because cell phones are made up of so many different parts. Glass, plastic, uh, metals. Metals require water for um, getting out of the ground as well as refining. So wherever you turn, you can see there's water being used and generally large volumes of water. Um, and you can, if you've got the resources, you can figure out pretty well how much water it takes to do many, uh, to almost anything. Uh, and they're always, always more water than you'd ever expect. Uh, I recently had a grandchild, so this is why this is more relevant to me. Um, this is an example of reuse, so, you know, and the, the whole debate. debate. Uh, so there's a remarkable difference in the amount of water involved uh, in uh, uh, reusing diapers versus a disposable. This probably applies to most disposable products. Uh, because it takes a lot to make anything. So I calculated out how much water it takes to wash a bunch of diapers and to come up with this particular uh, statistic. Now, uh, disposable, disposable diapers are made of wood products, wood fibers, plastics, a bunch of stuff. And that's why it's a pretty high number. But uh, cotton, of course, is quite large as well. But because you reuse it, say 50 times is what I use as the baseline, which isn't exactly a lot, uh, but I think uh, a reasonable number. That means that uh, you get a bunch of better uh, value uh, in terms of the water consumption. So just to recap, we've got water that we know about, the one we see, and then the, the hidden water, the water that we use uh, but without knowing that we're using water. So why, so let's talk a bit more about food. So yeah, obviously all food products uh, require water. Some require a little bit more. Avocados get a lot of wrap because they need a lot of water. Now very often um, it's growing things in the wrong place that creates these larger water uh, footprints. Uh, so California being an example of the avocado problem, it's because most of California is a desert. So maybe you shouldn't be growing fruits that need tropical rainfall you know, levels of water in a desert. Uh, California does a lot of things kind of along those lines. They grow rice. Uh, it's the largest dairy uh, producer in the US. Uh, dairy cows need a lot of water. They need a lot of food. Uh, you know, Wisconsin is not the, the dairy, dairy state, really, uh, although it should be because it's much wetter. It has much better water resources than California does. Um, uh, processing takes a little bit more as well. So big difference for uh, just a regular bottle of ketchup, 140 gallons. Um, one thing I wanted to also mention is that there's a growing things in the wrong place thing, which is part of our global trade system. So oranges, for instance, are not just grown in Florida. Uh, they're grown in really dry places like Egypt. So most of Europe gets their oranges from Egypt, which is, again, all desert. Uh, and they use the water from the Nile to irrigate. And all of those oranges are exported, so it's 80 liters of water, so that's like 20 gallons um, for each orange. So all that water is being shipped from a very dry country to wetter countries up in Europe, which doesn't make sense. Uh, there's a lot of things like that in the global food trade that don't make sense. So this is just another one. This is the, the water thing that doesn't make any sense in the global food trade. Um, again, beef. So that's for 200 kilograms or 400 pounds of beef. You know, 3 million, or 820,000 gallons. Again, it's the food they eat that's the biggest. So the... Um, most animals are not that efficient in processing the food that they eat. Um, and then there's all sorts of problems with the kinds of foods that we're feeding them. Uh, just, just to give an example of different types of meats, there is lower uh, chicken being the lowest of all the meats. Uh, so chickens, God love them, are efficient little uh, grain eaters. Although, mind you, chickens would rather eat insects and bugs than grain. 
Um, so if you've ever seen free-range chickens on fresh on a fresh piece of grass, they go crazy for bugs, insects, worms. Um, they'll also eat meat, too, if you give them a chance. Um, so yes, if you're going to have uh, meat and you're concerned about water usage, uh, chicken is the better way to go. So looking at uh, various diets, a meat-based diet is a lot more water intensive than a vegetarian diet. So you can save 250,000 gallons a year yourself just by switching from meat to a vegetarian diet. I think that's a, you know, enormous uh, savings in terms of water and in terms of water resources, which I'm going to talk about in a second. So that's the uh, water scarcity map, the global map. So there isn't too many places that are in the green. So this is the, um, an estimate of how much water uh, resources people have over an entire year. And for most of the world, there are months there is a month or many months where they don't have enough water. And that includes the U.S. So large parts of the U.S. Uh, in the last few years especially have had not enough water during the summer or have had to have restrictions or have had drought problems. And even in Canada last year, the last three years actually, also just like California, so Canada's west coast, which is known as the wet coast because it's north of uh, Washington state, so it seems to me it rains there all the time every time I go there, but they've had uh, droughts and water rationing. Uh, you know, this is where Canada has its rainforest. Uh, um, and that's just been unprecedented. A lot of that has to do with uh, climate change. So water scarcity has come to the point where at least two out of five people are experiencing severe water scarcity right now. And that's expected to increase to three in five by 2020. So that's the, uh, this is, well, there you go, February 1st. It's the middle of winter, you know, basically one of the wettest times of the year in the U.S., and yet much of the U.S. is in drought. California's a little bit better because they've, uh, at least the northern part of California, because they've had some winter rains, but the southern part's still really dry. And then Texas and uh, wherever states they are down there. Um, yeah, so it's still, you know, it's an ongoing problem. And that map... Uh, let's say six months ago, was a lot more red uh, than it was white. Under the climate change projections to 2090, that's the, uh, what the conditions will be more like. So you can see the top of the Alaska and across the northern Canada will have more rain than they have currently, more w snow as well. Whereas central U.S. and Mexico will basically be in severe, severe drought much of the year uh, based on current emissions as usual. So without cutting climate change, uh, reducing the emissions, um, that's the future scenario. You can see the Caribbean as well. A lot of places uh, will be uninhabitable. You won't be able to grow food because it'll be too dry. And you have to move north, and everybody says, oh, well, well I'll go to Canada, because you've got lots of room up there, and lots of land. Well, actually, you know, <laughs> most of Canada is actually rocks. It's pretty tough to grow things on rocks. Yeah, it's either really boggy, or it's all rocks. So um, I'm not sure that's going to be much of an option in the future. And that's why the uh, World Economic Forum... Uh, this is from a couple of years ago, but they said the same thing uh, just a couple of weeks ago, that uh, the biggest risks in the facing the world are what both water crises, you know, failure to deal with uh, climate change, extreme weather events. Uh, they said the same things again. That so for about three or four years now, they've been saying this is what we should be concerned about and doing something about in the next few years because this is the things that are pressuring us. Now, agriculture is, um, as it's currently practiced, is uh, problematic because it uses huge amounts of water. Around the world, 70% of all water use. Um, a lot of the water is polluted. Once again, as I say, much of the water that's used isn't reused. It goes up into the part of the water cycle and it goes elsewhere. 
There's a number of examples of where agriculture has dried out entire areas. There's the famous one in, in Europe, uh, where I think it was Russia, um, where they dried up an entire lake and uh, by over pumping the aquifers and uh, damming streams so they could uh, grow cotton. And now the whole place is just a desert. And you know, California is in the same state, uh, going the same way. Other places, Egypt's another one, uh, some in the Middle East as well. Uh, places like uh, Saudi Arabia actually had, uh, they always hear about all the oil they have, but they have had gigantic aquifers full of water uh, until they decided that they would uh, grow wheat and a couple other crops. Again, Saudi Arabia is just basically a big sand pile. But if you pump enough water, put enough fertilizer in, you can grow stuff. And they ended up uh, depleting their aquifer, and now they, um, and they were actually exporting wheat. And now, of course, they have to import it because they don't have any water left. And then they have to spend money on desalination. Uh, looking at the larger food system entirely, not just the water thing, but um, the food production system is, has a whole bunch of problems which people here have been talking about all week. Uh, this comes out of a, of a study that was done 10 years ago now. It was the IPCC, so the climate change guys, science. They did something for agriculture 10 years ago. So there's a similar process, many, many years. People all around the world got together and said, okay, how can we produce enough food to feed the world and deal with climate change at the same time. And they unequivocally said the way we're producing food, the industrial food system, is the wrong approach entirely. This is not going to uh, work. Um, now, that was the sort of definitive statement about where we need to go. Unfortunately, that was completely ignored. Uh, <laughs> I was the only journalist, actually, at their final meeting, and uh, they weren't able to, it was supported by the World Bank and a bunch of other people, but uh, the biotech industry uh, pulled its uh, support of the entire idea because they weren't uh, considered necessary for the future. Um, and so that report just ended up nowhere. Um, and this is kind of a re-attempt by many of the people involved in that to continue this work that they've done to remind people, yeah, we need to change the way we're producing food. So, what can we all do about this water scale here? Well, the easiest thing is you know, what you do at home. You know, the, the not having the water run while you're brushing your teeth, um, low flow toilets, uh, watch uh, how much time you spend in the shower or have a low flow shower. Um, not having water running. I mean, there's many, many, many ways and lots of good advice th these days about how to do it. Changing your lawn from a, a lawn that requires watering. Grass is not a natural, um, you know, monoculture. It needs to be, you know, uh, fed and watered otherwise. Uh, um, and, you know, get rid of your lawn. I haven't had a lawn in, well, I don't know, 25 years because I hated cutting grass. It was boring. And the grass itself is boring. Um, so we just did a, you know, wildflower garden that more or less nature took over after the first two or three years and you know the birds planted the seeds for us and we ended up with many many surprises and lots of wildlife coming into uh, our front lawn and then I, I, I don't want to say how many times people would come by and say oh my god your lawn is gorgeous and then you know so the neighbor would be in the next street and I'd see them you know fertilizing their lawn it seemed very difficult to you know get people to uh, change habits um, you know, even by having an example. I think that is changing. There are a lot of places where people are uh, keen to have more, a more interesting lawn. Pollinators is a great reason to have it. Um, and there's lots of other ones. It's just way more interesting. And it's, you feel better in it uh, as well. It's just, there's something about that diversity of nature that makes you feel better. Um, so get rid of your lawns. And there are actually programs at West that will pay people to get rid of their lawns. Yeah, because it's wasting too much of their water. So they say, okay, we'll pay you to get rid of it. Um, so the virtual water, the, the hidden water savings. So the three R's actually turned out to be pretty good. Uh, <laughs> as our, um, you know, reduce 
consumption of stuff. Anything we're consuming required water to produce. You reuse, you know, take old clothes. I mean, we all have probably, I don't know, maybe a million gallons worth of water sitting in our closets. So take it to a reuse store, a thrift store, you know, and let somebody else use it. You know, you don't need to have a million gallons of water just sitting in your closet. Similarly, you know, when you're purchasing things, that's some of the things you have to, uh, I think, keep in mind. We're hoping to do a number of things in our communities to, you know, reuse tools, for instance. Because, again, those things all took a lot of water to uh, produce. Um, I don't know if you have restores here, so that's furniture and, uh, you know, building materials, all sorts of stuff that can be reused, sometimes recovered from houses that are being renovated and they can be reused for something else. Uh, obviously recycling, again, is uh, w less uh, water savings there because e even recycling a plastic bottle takes water to make a new bottle or to recycle it into another product. Better to have uh, a reusable container like this or the water bottles, right? I'm not gonna... Ah, very nice. Um, Switching diet, even just meatless Mondays, which be has become, I guess, a bit of a fad. Meatless Mondays just means you and your family decide um, at least one day a week. Anyways, you're not going to have meat. Uh, for some people, that's a big deal. Uh, and you can save 110,000 gallons for a family of four. Not uh, avoiding food waste. Uh, you know, Costco is probably the biggest uh, problem here. Uh, people buying gigantic quantities of things. I know my brother is always talking about these loads of stuff he buys and what the prices were, but I swear half of it ends up being thrown out because you forget uh, or it's been in the freezer too long, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so th the majority of food waste is actually at home, uh, not in the fields. And 40% means 40% of the water it took to make all that food is also being wasted. And again, can't be reused. Um, again, what are shopping, when we're shopping, think about the price, not just in terms of the dollars, but in terms of the water, um, which gets us to need versus want. Do, we really, do I really need something? So if you really need something, buy something that's going to last forever. Um, you know, I got, you know, shoes that I've had for 25 years that I still wear um, because I bought a good pair that were comfortable and were very well made. And they certainly cost more than an average pair of, you know, whatever, 995 somethings. Um, so when you have to make a purchase, but the, that buy something that's going to last for a long time. But it's the need versus want, which is a difficult thing for us because we're all exposed to 5,000 ads per day that's telling us we want this, we want that, and we want this other thing, and we will be, um, we will be. Uh, a better person for it. In fact, I wrote an article just recently for Vice about bottled water uh, marketing. So, <laughs> bottled wa water uh, companies are clever. They basically promise us health and longevity, you know, from drinking their product. Uh, there was one company that had basically saying, uh, drink our water and uh, you'll be young forever. You know, that was the message of it. Um, and we all, you know, would like to live forever. We all have a, um, uh, a fear of, of, of our own mortality. It's, it's kind of a human thing. We're always sort of struggling with it. Most of the time we'd like to ignore it. Um, and uh, the advertisers are clever enough to prey on this to uh, influence our buying decisions. So just beware. It's difficult to resist it, though. So finally, it takes a lot of water to make anything. I hope that's been clear. Um, we're in a situation where there isn't enough to go around at the current pace that we're going. Um, the good news is we can use a lot more, a uh, lot less water than we're using currently um, because we haven't actually valued water in the way that we should. Uh, we haven't been smart about water. We hardly ever think about water as, a, uh, as an important resource. Uh, when we're making decisions, let's say, to change I don't know, a farm to a golf course. Does anybody consider the water use? It happens very rarely. 
Uh, golf course, we use a lot more water than a farm, or depending on the farm. But just when our sort of ordinary decisions made at the local level, um, water is rarely f a factor in it, and that needs to change. And I think one of the bottom lines here is we need to respect and value water as sacred, because for almost all of human history, springs were considered sacred places. Um, you know, ancient peoples and traditional peoples uh, treated water as a sacred, and, and uh, to this day. So I had an experience in Australia where um, some Aborigines invited me to their camp, a remote camp uh, way up in the northern part of Queensland, which is more dry tropical forest. And it's a camp camp, you know, tents and things. Uh, no running water, no electricity, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, and I was happy to be there to, you know, it was a bit of an honor to be there. And, uh, but quickly it was like, oh, no running water, right. So that means I got to tromp through the jungle with buckets or jugs to get water from the stream. Now Australia is, uh, is, uh, has a more, you know, amenable climate in terms of temperature, but it's got a lot more dangerous things than Canada even does. So we're talking poisonous snakes, poisonous spiders, plants that'll um, paralyze you if you brush by them, um, that kind of thing. Uh, so going to get water was never uh, easy. Not to mention it was heavy. And it seemed to me, you know, I was going back and forth several times every day, you know, helping bringing water for cooking and cleaning and drinking and all the rest of it. And so I, after a few days, I <coughs> eventually complained about this a little bit. And they said, oh, well, <coughs> you need to have a, you know, change your perspective about water. Uh, so they took me to a waterfall, so a remote part of the bush, and there was a small waterfall, um, and they said, this is where we initiate our sh shamans, so the uh, holy guys who do uh, <coughs> medicine work. And they said, well, one of the final initiations is the, sh the would-be shaman has to take this big rock and go down to the bottom of the uh, waterfall, pool, and stay there and drown. Uh, it's, so it's not an you know, when they come back, uh, then they know that this is a true shaman because the spirit of the waterfall, who has a very long, complicated name, I can't remember, um, has deemed them worthy to be um, uh, a shaman and that they can connect with the spirit world. So to the Aborigines, this particular waterfall had its own, was its own particular spirit, which embodied certain things, medicine being one, health another. And they took this very seriously, although the current shaman said it had been a while since anybody had tried it. Uh, and he was a little bit nervous about uh, the future that the young people <coughs> weren't uh, quite as keen on trying this uh, initiation ceremony, uh, which I can hardly blame them. But um, it taught me the lesson that <coughs> there are still people who treat water as sacred uh, and see it as a spiritual thing. And, you know, when you really think about it, uh, if you're running out of water, uh, um, <clears throat> you do realize how important it is to, uh, to us, just from a personal point of view, but also from our entire way of life, our entire society. So, oh, the slide doesn't work. Uh, so that's my final slide here, which says uh, we need to value water more and uh, that we need to also make sure we sil uh, choose uh, our leaders at all levels, um, not on the basis of their smile, but on the basis of their knowledge about how the world actually functions. Um, you, know, it, you know, we uh, keep electing people who uh, have no clue about uh, how the world works, how everything's connected, how important water is, how important many of the things we're talking about here. Um, it's just like, you know, going up in a plane with somebody you picked at random to be the pilot. I mean, we'd never do that, but yet we are doing that with our local uh, leaders as well as our business leaders. So that's the kind of thing we need to change. There's actually a group that's trying to, uh, you know, make all political leaders pass a ecological liter literacy test. It'd be nice, but I'm not sure that's going to happen. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a group in Germany, so if Germany gets it started, you know, maybe, maybe it could happen. 
So um, again, I hope uh, you've uh, come to see the water is more valuable and useful than oil, um, and that you have gained a little water vision. And I hope you join me in being water wise and learning and learning to respect and value water for what its true worth is to all of us. Thanks. One second. You had to carry your water. How far were you carrying your water? Uh, was it was like about a tenth of a mile, a quarter of a mile. It was about 200 yards. How many gallons you carry at a time? Uh, two. Yeah. Or were you? Did you have a huge bucket? Uh, two buckets, so. Five five gallon buckets, or? Uh, I think not. Full. Yeah, two five gallon buckets, but not full <laughs> to the top because it's much, too heavy. <laughs> it's too heavy. My shoulders aren't what they used to be. Yeah. Yeah. I think every American needs to carry water at least a quarter of a mile, and then they'd have more respect for it. Yeah, actually, in one of my uh, presentations at school groups, I have kids piggyback each other around to say, okay, you just move this much water. And, <laughs> and it's always, you know, one or two kids who say, oh, yeah, yeah, I can do this. And get them back and forth a few times. They go, oh, no, do I have to still? Yeah, you still got to go a couple more times. Yeah. Do you, do you know about some seeds or plants which are cleaning, um, can clean water? Seeds or plants that contain water, or that can clean water. Oh, clean water. Yes. Um, no, I don't. Uh, do you? I think I was hearing about some seeds, but I don't know what kind of seeds or plants this is. No. Oh, well, there are plants that do clean water. Yeah, I, th I think I, I see what you mean. So there's um, so uh, they call them constructed wetlands. So you can actually use uh, plants that you would see in a, a marsh to clean water, and some. Some small communities have actually used that instead of water treatment plants. They actually use plants to clean the water uh, from uh, sewage. Uh, and this is uh, becoming more and more effective. It's actually cheaper to do, uh, easier to maintain. Uh, it takes a little bit to figure out how to do it exactly right, but there are places that are doing it, yeah. And in a similar fashion, uh, New York City gets its water pretty well untreated from, I guess it's the Catskills because they projected all the greenery up there. Um, they didn't build a water treatment plant. They were planning to, I think it was 10 years ago. Uh, they weren't gonna spend six or eight billion dollars to build a plant. They said, okay, we're just gonna buy more land and uh, make sure the farmers don't use any chemicals or fertilizers. And uh, the other land they were going to uh, preserve as its nature areas uh, and use, let nature clean the water for. So in New York City, it's not the only city. Uh, Rio does the same thing. Vienna. There's a few other cities that actually don't treat their water because they've protected the land nearby. Uh, you were talking about ecological literacy. Is the university in general uh, on this problem? Because I think there is a lot of ignorance, really. People don't know. Uh, yeah, generally not. If you go into an environmental program, yes, you will learn something about that. But if you're in an MBA program, no, you're not going to learn about that. So part of the problem is we've divided up. We said the environment is just this one narrow specialty. And it's not. The environment is everything. Exactly. It should be really yeah, it's, <laughs> more it's, important. It's, it's pretty crazy. But that's the way we've set up our academic institutions. Uh, it should be a basic thing that you learn at a very young age, and it continues through uh, our education system, but it doesn't. It ends up being a, just a narrow specialty, which, you know, ends up creating a lot of the problems we have. People can't talk to each other because the environmental scientist, let's say, um, you know, understands ecology, talking to the business person, you know, and their languages are almost uh, incomprehensible to each other. Uh, so this is not not a good situation. Um, so it means we need more and more people to become ecologically aware as well. And usually the countries that have a, a larger problem are the ones that are poor countries, so they don't have the power to spread the word. Yeah, yeah. Albeit, uh, a lot of things that some poor countries do, um, which are considered backward, uh, are better ecologically than the modern ways. 
Um, so a lot of farmers who do things in Africa, like traditional way of multiple types of plants together, that's considered inefficient farming by modern standards. And when a student from, say, Nigeria comes to the U.S. to learn about farming, they learn our way. And then he goes back and he tells, and it's almost always a he, tells the f women farmers, because it's usually women farmers in Africa, you're doing it all wrong, it's all backwards, you can't do that, you gotta plant one crop and you get some fertilizer and you put some chemicals on and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, there's, a, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's some real big disconnects in the way uh, uh, we're doing farming and you know, some of the traditional ways actually made a lot more sense than the modern ways. Yes, hi. Um, I wanted to say something about uh, the wetlands, mm. and that's our natural filtering to clean the waters that go into the rivers and into the bays and uh, eventually into the oceans. And out east on Long Island, we've become very conscious of that because uh, the Peconic River going out into the Peconic Bay is in serious trouble with high nitrogen levels right now. And so in everything we're doing out there, we're working on uh, the on keeping the wetlands clean and um, trying to clean up the river. It, it's really a mess out there. So, and the other thing I wanted to say is that, uh, could you say something about collecting rainwater and uh, what we can do with that? Yeah, so from a, great to hear that you guys are involved in uh, uh, trying to keep the uh, shoreline vegetation uh, healthy and growing. I mean, in some places, uh, anywhere along a water, uh, in Canada, you can't have a lawn, it has to be natural, so you can't have grass. So, th th because it's, it's th for those very reasons, to keep the nitrates out of the water. Um, your second question was about? Rainwater, collecting oh yeah, rain rainwater. Water. Uh, yeah, no, it's a great way to uh, um, uh, save water. I've got a rain barrel at home, we use it for the garden. Um, it's, so it's dead easy to do, you know, everybody's got a, a downspout and you plug it in and uh, there's lots of great uh, products you can make your own too. I had an old whiskey barrel for a long time until it fell apart. Uh, yeah. Yes, at first it had a little odd flavor, but uh, <coughs> but uh, but uh, it's a fabulous way to do it. It, it. There's even much better systems that have underground uh, storage tanks in Australia. That's what they use uh, because it's Australia. Good parts of Australia are very dry, and so uh, they have huge, like the size of a swimming pool underground tank for storing water. And they can also use that water for uh, washing and showers. Um, uh, not for drinking, but that, that's, that's their system. And uh, I think a lot of places in California are developing the same kinds of uh, reusing uh, rainwater as well as reusing gray water. Uh, again, water from, say, your sink. You can use it to water your plants. In your opinion, um, which is the best water or had for, for health consumption. We, we, we get water from bottled water, tap water, mm. filtered water, uh, reverse osmosis water. But for, for human consumption and health-wise, have you seen anything that you would recommend? We got well water, we got everything, spring water. Yeah, that's a good question because water is uh, highly variable depending on where you are. Um, uh, because water, you know, absorbs <laughs> most things. Um, I get my water from a spring. So uh, this is just kind of a fortuitous circumstance where uh, there's a spring not far from my house where the water actually comes right out of the ground and it's a nature reserve. Um, and so, yeah, that's where I get my drinking water from. Um, and that's not something everybody can do because you're not in you know fortunate uh, situation. Yeah, and the water's f fabulous. Um, other places have, you know, good quality drinking water, like New York City is supposed to have some of the best uh, drinking water, right from the tap. Um, it really depends on where you are. Other places like the Midwest, like Kansas, a lot of the drinking water has got nitrates in it from all the fertilizers. It's hard to remove it. Some, some places have had to put special filtration in to get rid of it. Uh, it's, you know, it's not healthy for you. Um, uh, the bottled water industry, you have to be a very educated consumer because a lot of companies, say mainstream companies anyways, they sell you tap water for, you know, 10 times the price or 100 times the price 
that you can get it from the from the tap yourself. Um, so you got to know uh, who you're dealing with. Um, I, d I don't know this particular company, but uh, Stephen says that the real deal. And uh, you know, so if it effectively, it sounds like they're doing what I'm doing at home. I have my glass jugs. I, I trot them down to the spring. I fill it up, the dozen jugs or whatever, and I take them away. Uh, sounds like they're doing something similar, just making it more accessible to everybody. This spring has not become commercialized yet. <laughs> I hope it uh, doesn't. Uh, but um, uh, those are some of the choices. And filtration, yeah. There's a, a filtration and, and dis distillation can all uh, be useful depending on your circumstances, depending on your water resource that you happen to have. Um, I can't say I know in California. Um, there's probably some place where you could get spring water. It's not impossible, uh, but I, I'm afraid I don't know. Yeah, yeah. There's actually a website called Find a Spring where users go into that website and they put in springs that they know about and you can actually locate it throughout the world actually. Huh. Well, thanks. I never knew that. That's cool. You know, Israel being a very innovative and at the same time very dry country as well with uh, minimal rain. How do they sustain their agriculture, or how do they actually conserve water? Do you have any idea? Um, yeah, you're right. Israel did pioneer a lot of stuff when it comes to water saving. So one of the things they do is uh, drip irrigation. So that's like having a uh, thin pipe that goes down the rows of the plants, and it's got a little hole by each plant, and it drips water right directly onto the plant or onto the base of the plant. Um, so that minimizes the evaporation, which is a big problem in Israel, which is, again, desert. Um, and, so we, and you also pr precisely put the water you know, where the, right to the roots of the plant. Um, and so that system is way more efficient than any other form of irrigation. Um, so that's one thing they do. They also use uh, like compost and things to you know, keep the soil cooler as well as keep the moisture uh, inside the earth, um, again, maximizing the efficiency of the, the water that they do put down. You know, the other thing I heard some time ago, I don't know whether it's true or not, they're saying that the Negev Desert is actually becoming smaller rather than bigger. Is that true? Some time ago I, hear, I heard that yeah. there's the only desert in the world where it's actually shrinking. Uh, that I don't know anything about. I'm afraid I don't know why that would be happening, but uh, could be their farming parts of the desert, uh, maybe. That's what they mean. Um, that whole area in the Middle East is getting drier and drier. It's not getting wetter. Um, the temperatures there have been super hot in the last uh, few years, you know, 120, 130 degrees. It's tough. To, that, that's making it more difficult to grow plants uh, there uh, just because the temperatures are getting so high. I want to m make a comment. Uh, so, of course, we know we are a consumeristic society. So, we are seen as not normal if we don't change a phone every, you know, two years. And I could go on and on and on. Uh, so that's that's one thing. Most people want to fit in, and they won't change because they just don't want to be different. Then the other thing is needs versus wants that you touched on. And one of the things that people think it's a need, it's a want, animal foods. So everything derived from animals, all animal foods, are really a want for taste. So meatless Monday is not going to work. So doc Dr. Oppenlander is not here to talk about it. And meatless Mondays, from environmental standpoint, you are saving the world one day of the week 
and killing it the other six. And from ethical standpoint of view, you are ex needlessly exploiting sentient beings six days of a week. And then even on meatless Mondays, increase of um, consumption of dairy and eggs. It I mean, consumption of dairy and eggs mm. increased. So you are really not doing much for ethical reasons or the planet. And sustainable animal products is not a thing because if we st look at the grazed beef, that is, yes, using less water, but it's using more land. So at that point, you're using more land. And as my friend over here reminded me, 400 gallons of water to process one carcass of mm -hmm. cow. So we need to start. And I'm a scientist uh, involved in medical, mm, medical business. So we shouldn't look. So they are looking at medicine as a liver and uh, you know, a heart and breast as breast cancer and everything separate. So we are not, we are a human being in an environment interacting with animals. So we should start looking at, and what you said, it's true. I mean, I was trained as a molecular biologist. I shouldn't look at anything else. This mm -hmm. is what they're like. Right now I have the luck to be interacting with the community psychologist. We are trying to change the world, but I mean, it just, and he will do good things. This is what I know. And I turned him vegan. So he's seeing things from a different perspective. So just that's, I mean, I don't know if you want to add something to it, but this is just, I mean, because Dr. Op Oppenlander opened my eyes after I turned vegan. And I just, I mean, this is what I think a lot of people should, should really mm. think about. Yeah, um, thanks for your comments. Those are quite true. Uh, um, when it comes to uh, uh, even f uh, grass-fed beef, it's still a, uh, a problem of land use. Uh, it still uses a lot of water. It's still a climate problem, even though it's better than the, the other forms of production. I mean, these are, as you say, more of a Band-Aid solution to uh, what the real problems are. Uh, I have been, I used to be a, an ag reporter, so I have been inside uh, slaughterhouses and factory farms and all those places many years ago. And it's, uh, you know, <laughs> nobody really wants to be there, including the animals. And so they shouldn't be there. Um, so yes, uh, there's a lot of advantages to shifting to uh, vegetarian and veganism. There's more and more athletes actually now uh, saying this is the best thing they ever did, you know, professional athletes. Um, so I think that's actually starting to change. Definitely in the U.S., meat consumption is down, uh, also in Europe. Um, so I think there's a turn that's happened, and it's a uh, you know important turn. Is it happening fast enough? No, but um, we have to be uh, patient sometimes with some folks. As I say, for some people, I tell you, I couldn't believe the number of people who were like, about meatless Mondays going, well, I could never do that. Seriously, I, I was flabbergasted too. I went, what? No, yeah. my sons would never accept that. It's like, whoa, okay. You're in charge there, mom. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, right here. Oh, uh, well, uh, just a statement to that. Even the Catholics a long time ago during Lent would give up meat for hmm. a day, but then they went to fish, so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I empathize with you about carrying water, living in Alaska. We, uh, uh, many bush communities, dry uh, cabins, living, living that way. Well, actually, we, our, our home while we were building it was uh, semi-remote, and it remained dry for a long time. And so we, we hauled a lot of water. So uh, we, we learned then how important it, you know, water is. Um, but I, do you it, 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 do you have uh, any numbers pertaining to a vegan diet as opposed to a vegetarian diet? Um, no, I don't. Uh, I didn't get into that. Uh, that would be a really interesting. I don't know if I could work it out. I can't work it out right now in my head, but I think I could figure out how to do it. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it would be uh, at least ten percent uh, less than say the vegetarian okay. because of the eggs and milk. Yeah, at least ten percent. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Uh, I, uh, the question is 2090, uh, that number you had up there with the yeah. map of the, uh, does this uh, projection include aquifers too? Like, are they gonna disappear also in the ground? Yeah, in, in, the, in yes, because probably well before then because almost all the aquifers are uh, oversubscribed, meaning we're taking out more and more, way more water than um, they can be replenished. The Ogala, that's probably, the Ogala one, the big giant one in the Midwest, it's dropping, you know, many feet per year. Uh, it's uh, one of the industries that's sucking a lot of water out is the energy industry, the fracking guys. So they use five million gallons per frack. Sometimes a well is fracked a couple of times. And that water is contaminated and is then has to be pumped underground. Very little is recycled, reused. And that water is pumped deep underground, away from aquifers, because it would just contaminate them. Um, and so that's a permanent loss of water from the water cycle. So this process of getting gas and oil using fracking is uh, uh, probably the biggest permanent removal of water in human history. Because um, most other times it's actually really hard to get rid of water out of the global water cycle. You talked earlier, <coughs> you talked earlier about uh, a program to replace your lawn. They'll pay you. Do you go to your city for that? Do you go to a website for that? Who do you talk to? Uh, it's uh, cities, uh, communities, yeah. Uh, West, like uh, Las Vegas is one that does it. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if uh, there might be something in some communities in California. You were talking about fracking, and that's something that uh, is a major problem and, a, and even more of a problem that we know because the, not only is it, is it water, but it's also, uh, uh, they use cracks at 9,500, in other words, that, that they pump with the water down, in other words, to scrub <coughs> and use the bubbles that are used as hydraulics, in other words, to pull that water out. And if anyone doesn't know what 90, cracks at 95, hundred is they need to look it up because what's happening is is not only are they using this water but they are making it unavailable for human consumption period yeah that's true the uh, the process involves dumping a lot of nasty chemicals that being one of them um, to uh, make this whole thing work and so that's why the water that's why so little of it's reused or recycled because they can't even use it because it's so bad um, and makes it extremely difficult to clean up Any other questions? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.